Matt Most is one of our boys. He is super knowledgeable about Asian rat snakes. So instead of me talking, let's show you what he's got going on. Hey Ryan and Ben. Well, Maggie's excited to do this video today. Mm-hmm. Well, sorry it's been a little bit of time and lag in some of this YouTube content that we've been working with Ryan and Ben and R&B Reptiles to produce. Um, Maggie and I, we started talking about stuff and you know, a lot of things kind of changed last year. Obviously, COVID hit everyone big time, right? Um, in terms of slowing down some of the different things and also, I would say, making things a lot more challenging too as well. Um, but on a side note, we're ready to start doing this again and we're ready for video number three, which we're going to talk about one of my favorite species and I think a number of other people too as well. This was actually the species that got me into Asian rat snakes and Porphyracea as a complex, it, it's pretty amazing when you start to look at distribution maps, looking at different subspecies, looking at some of the different, uh, I would say, natural occurring um, aspects of their behavior, but also the way that they look too as well in different geographical locations. Uh, this past year, he ended up working with Kevin Messenger um, on a new publication that's available on Amazon, and I also have a couple of copies that are uh, signed, still available. This book, The Asian Rat Snakes and Kin of Greater China, um, has a lot of information not only directly related to the natural history of these species, but also some of the captive husbandry aspect, breeding behavior, um, egg laying, incubation techniques that we use here. Um, and it even has Maggie's picture inside of it too. So she's excited about it and I'm sure a bunch of you are too as well. Um, a number of you have already ordered this off of Amazon and we appreciate that too as it helps to support Kevin's research in the field. But going on off that, should we get the snake out? Mm -hmm. All right. So in terms of talking about porphyracea, I'm gonna pull out coxi to begin with. Um, in my opinion, as well as a number of other people, Robin, I'm sure too as well, um, this is like the epitome of porphyracea. This is, you know, the starting point. I mean, just in terms of the way that they look, I mean, you don't see many animals that have that striking orange, black racing stripes um, coming off of it. Maggie wants to hold her. This is a female that I ended up pulling out, and if you notice, I ended up taking the animal out with a hook. Um, I do a lot of hooking in practice here as well, as I've worked with venomous in the past, primarily during graduate school, and posted some videos too as well on our Facebook and Instagram pages. But I find that it's easier to take out an animal using a hook because the animal isn't as uh, frightened or threatened from that aspect. Now, you know, a lot of people will say that these animals strike, they bite repeatedly. You know, a lot of it just has to do with the natural approach with actual handling and care of that respective animal. You know, Maggie's holding the animal, um, moving very slow, not moving very fast, and that is important to take into consideration with not only the porphyracea, but I would say all animals too as well. Um, porphyracea do have a high feeding response, so if you are coming into the cage, you know, I would recommend coming in with a hook because they might be a little bit nippy. But in terms of our husbandry and care of the animals, we moved a lot of our caging over the past couple of years towards the ARS series for um, specific reasons, but also close proximity. We do live in Indiana and it, it makes it nice and easy just to call and pick up orders, or at least it used to be that way until a lot of these different material shortages too. But these are a high humidity loving animal. We do set up our cages with cypress mulch with a high water bowl. And I've actually added a number of aeration holes for ventilation, both on the front, the side and the back. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that me personally, I don't like to have stagnant air inside of the actual cage. We keep this cage at a cool side of about 66 to about 75 degrees. And that's in Fahrenheit. Um, but moist stagnant air can actually build up and create a lot of issues for 
not only new keepers, but experienced keepers as well. Um, if you have that stagnant air inside of your environment, you could actually be building up mold, um, also different bacteria, um, also potentially even giving rise to some protozoans that could cause some issues inside of your, um, not only cage and animal, but your entire collection. So I like having the aspect that you have nice defined airflow through the respective environment. Um, now within Porphyraceae themselves, you have the four subspecies. You have Coxi, Latisinctus, Volanti, and Pulcher. Um, we've worked with all four of them, um, and those are the four subspecies that are common within the hobby itself. There are, um, in theory, a couple more, and hopefully over the next couple years we'll find out a little bit more on the definition of those subspecies and whether or not there aren't potentially some um, species level aspects of Porphyracea. So Maggie's been getting a little handsy with this female. I get it. She's good looking. But in terms of the care breeding aspects of these animals, you know, with those four subspecies, you are going to keep them pretty much very similar across the board. The only defining thing that I would say that differentiates the four subspecies is Volanti requires a bromation or cooling period for both follicular development as well as um, uh, good sperm for the males too as well, that fertility rate. The other, uh, Pulcher, Coxi, Letisinctus, you don't necessarily need to cool those animals to get good fertility. And I've proved it in the past. One of the reasons why in some aspects I still cool the other three is just purely because of time. Um, it's nice to have a little bit of a break during the winter aspect and focus on some of the other species that I work with, primarily from Africa. But that also taking into regards, um, Volanti would cool that species down into the low 60s. Um, and I think it's very important not only to think about cooling, but also your light cycle, food cycle in those animals, because that does have a big important rate with the um, fertility as well as manipulation of the seasons too. But in terms of breeding cocci, we do start our introductions in February, March, and we'll continue and cycle those animals. Uh, cocci in particular is kind of interesting because they will lay multiple clutches throughout the year. We've had as many as four or five clutches. Um, egg size in terms of clutch uh, does vary, but with that being said, you will get multiple clutches out of Latisinctus very similarly. You can get two clutches out of Pulcher a year. And with Volanti, primarily the Chinese variety, you can get two clutches a year, but the Chinese, the Vietnamese variety, you only see about one clutch a year. And the difference between a lot of the different locales off of Volanti is that the Vietnamese animals will actually go through a change where their pattern disappears and they actually have dorsal banding that's red similar to cocci going down their back. Would you agree? Yes. Okay. And <laughs> saying that, um, I can pull out some other porphyracea, but as mentioned, um, the care is going to be very similar. You're going to see our setup the very same way, cypress mulch, a hide spot. Um, with some of our hatchling animals, we'll typically set them up in a six quart tub, um, hide spot, cypress mulch, water bowl too as well. Uh, we do find that the porphyracea have a higher digestive rate. With that digestive rate, we do end up feeding them a little more frequently every three to four days. And I do tend to feed on the smaller aspect of prey variety. So instead of offering one large mouse, I may offer one small mouse every three to four days. And that helps too as well, I find, for both the growth pattern of the animals and with some of that too as well. If you have any questions on Porphyracea, uh, feel free to reach out to myself or Maggie. I'm sure we'd both help, but Ryan and Ben also keep a variety of the Porphyracea too as well. Um, they've been having a great amount of success with Latisinctus and Pulcher and we hope that they'll be able to get a little more with the Volanti coming in the future. And 
Again, any questions, shoot me an email, Matt at Sarpometra, or you can send me a message on our Facebook page too as well. Or if you got comments or questions for Maggie, shoot her a question too. Maggie at Sarpometra.com. Boss lady. Thank you, Matt Most, for doing that video for us, and thank you for mini me. Yeah, you know who you are. Bamboo rat snakes are really exciting, really fun. We love them a lot. We have a handful of them. And uh, yeah, hopefully you guys got something out of that. Make sure you guys are watching some of these videos over here. We have, you know, a video that you'll probably like right here. But also check out some of our other channels that we have posting up here. I just keep pointing all over the place. Make sure you guys like, share, and subscribe this video. And uh, comment down below if there's something more that you want Matt Moss to talk about.